enough to uh, Italy. My, my assignment I always wanted, man. I was like, Vincenzo, Italy. He's like, hell yeah. yeah. But before I headed out, I think it was December, uh, Lunk, Lunk was, calls me and tells me, he's like, hey, man, I just wanted to get you, let you know that you're going to head out in August to Afghanistan. It's like, all right, for how long? About seven, eight months. I'm like, all right. And, you know, we're getting there, me and my family, in February of 05. Man. I was like, dude, how am I going to tell my wife, man? I was like, I just freaking... It was gone for a year. Iraq. I was a, a year in Korea. Yeah. And, and now in six months, I'm going to head out. So, I, dude, I had this plan, man. <laughs> I was like, my wife's hardcore Catholic. You know, she, you know, she loved Pope John Paul II. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to tell her in front of the Pope. And she can't yell at me. In front right. Of the Pope. You know, I'm dead, I'm, I'm dead, dead serious thinking that. <laughs> and then uh, if anyone knows the history of Pope John Paul II, you know, he dies in April of 2005. Oh, like, that's right. I was like, no. Oh, <sighs> Pope, you ruined my plans. <laughs> Yeah, so I think I was like, all right, we'll go to a funeral on top of there. Well, Italy's full of Catholics, man. You can take a train, drive, fly in there. It was just, unless you were somebody, you weren't going to get into Rome. Yeah. So I was like, all right, well, tell her afterwards. Well, afterwards, now June. I head out in August. Oh. And, and, and you know, I tell her and there at the Coliseum. With, I made sure to have my two-year-old son in my arms. Just in case she attacked me, I was like, sorry, son, you're going to be your human shield. <laughs> and I tell her, and she doesn't say anything. And I'm thinking, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, my God, my, my, my plan worked. Yeah. We're good to go. <laughs> we, got to the, we got to the room, man. That's where I saw devil face. Anyone that has a spouse knows what devil face is. It's, yeah. You know, you screwed up. Yeah. And we get into it. I mean, we get into it, just arguing. And, but it was my fault. Yeah. I knew since December of 04, and I wait till June of 05 to tell my wife. Yeah. And she got to one point where she tells me, after this tour, you get out or we're over. And I was like, how can you say that to me? And again, it wasn't, she wasn't trying to be vindictive. Sure, sure. But I always said I'll never let my son grow up without his dad like I did. But yet, my son was going to turn three and maybe knew me eight months out of his life. So he was growing up without his dad. Yeah. But this is how great my wife is. She kind of said, we'll talk about this later. I'll let you concentrate to go downrange. You know, even though she was pissed, she... Put everything, you know, so I can concentrate, you know, on hold so I can concentrate and go down range. Right, right. So, you know, head down range in August and, you know, I'm out there nonstop going in and out on missions because, you know, I was, we had two JTACs, but uh, Furman, he was the NCOIC, so we were staying in the talk most of the time. So mm-hmm. it was just me constantly going out and, you know, how it works, you know, it, they're going to send you where they think there's going to be the most danger. Right, right. Where they think they're going to get into, you know, possibly anything. Yeah. You know, so they have that fire support. And the day, you know, the day I got hit, you know, I was out with the scout team. And and we're coming back. Well, the night prior, to it, it was, you know, we're, we're doing uh, two hours sleep, one hour of a watch. And... You know, it was like the calm before the storm. Yeah. I remember looking up and, and I always compare it to when Forrest Gump's talking to Jenny about when he was in Vietnam and when it stopped raining, all these lights, uh, or uh, the clouds open up and you can see every single star. Oh, right, right. And, and, and that's what it felt like, dude. I, I was like, it was so calm. I was like, wow. And then that next morning, you know, we go out when we kind of hit uh, a town down there because, you know, the, the whole purpose of us being out there is when we had into there's a high value target, we had a capture, kill, and a supply route we had to destroy. 
Yeah. And just we just weren't finding anything. Uh, so we're, we're coming back. We we're going to pick up the other half of the scout team that was up on the mountain trying to catch these guys, you know, just in case they're, you know, coming up there. And we're coming back across this creek. And no more than 200 meters up to across this creek do I feel this intense heat blast on the left side. And I was like, holy shit, I just got hit. And people talk about, man, that your life flashed in front of you, but I never really believed that. Man, when I got hit, all these memories started coming through. It was almost like a like a movie reel. Yeah. You know, it was like all these images. But the the things I remember the most is three things that hadn't happened yet. Uh, it was one was like me and my wife finally getting married by the Catholic Church because every time we, we we tried, you know, I, I had I had on out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, second one was me and her honeymooning in Greece because that's where she always wanted to go. But lastly was me teaching my boy how to play ball, man, because I was a ball player. Uh, and then something in my head clicks like, dude, you got to get out of this truck. And I got out of the truck, but, but I was on fire from head to toe. Oh, my God. Uh, but I knew there was that creek behind me, about 200 meters. So I turn and I run. But the flames overtook me and I collapsed. And I'm thinking, this is it. I'm going to die here. Like, I'm, I'm, I broke my promise to my family that I always come back. Broke my promise to my son. I'll never let him grow up without his dad like I did. But most importantly, I'm going to break my promise to my dad that I'll always take care of my family. And I'm laying there. It's like, this is it. And then that's what the LT says, DT, you're not going to die here. And he helps me up, and we both jumped in the creek. And the sound I heard was the same sound you hear when you put a hot pan in cold water. But it's not a pan, it was my body. Man. And I look at the LT, I was like, like Sarah's like, yeah, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, DT, are you trying to be funny? I'm like, no, Sarah, I just got blown up. I was on fire, had to jump in a freezing cold creek in December here in Afghanistan. It sucked. <laughs> and, and I don't know if it was just me subconsciously trying to calm the situation down, but as soon as they hit me, they hit the guys that we're going to go pick up up on the mountain in a crossfire. So now they're calling back, hey, where's Gunslinger? Where's Gunslinger? We need cast. No, well, radios I had were destroyed. me were destroyed. Yeah. One of the, my backup were in the truck just got blown up. And I had to figure out what to do again. Remember, Remembering that promise to my dad. Yeah. Take care of your family. Like I said earlier, we're Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, you know, Space Force didn't exist back then because it was still in a galaxy far, far away. But, right. you know, but we're all brothers and sisters. They're my family. I had to figure out what to do. And the medic was trying to take care of me. You know, I was like, no, no, I'm good. All I asked him was like, dude, cut off my, my Ranger panties because the elastic was burning me. Oh. Uh, and, and, you know, yeah, my leg hurt. I saw a, couple, a little bit of blood, but I was okay. I was like, worry about our, our gunner Bailey who got got blown out and the truck had run over his legs. Oh, my God. Like, focus on him. Because I, I had to focus on, on the uh, other half of our team that's, you know, in the tick and, and the aircraft. So, luckily, one of the other scout guys had a number better. I was like, hey, man, get on this frequency. Repeat everything I say. So we can get some some help out here, and people ask me, "Well, did you control it?" It's like, no, I, I did coordination, and I'm not sure if it was Furman or or my or my troop. Um, uh, was it Shank who I left behind in, in, in our little uh, base because I knew it was a dangerous mission. Yeah, like, I don't know if it was one of those two that did a type two, uh, but when the last transmission went out, man. As much as I wanted to be Rambo, and maybe for a moment I did feel like Rambo, like nerves of steel, nothing was hurting me. But once that last transmission went out, dude, I started having a hard time breathing. I was getting scared. Yeah. Uh, I was like, dude, where's the medevac? Where's the medevac? Because I, I was getting scared. Uh -huh. uh, I was having a hard time breathing, and I told the medic, hey, man, let me just lay down and close my eyes for a bit. Let me just rest. And because I didn't think I was that bad. I was like, yeah, my arm, my leg hurt, but I have all my, all my body parts. 
Yeah. But he knew if he let me fall asleep, most likely I'm not going to wake up again. Oh my God. And so he kept, he kept me uh, up. He, he was trying to help me find my spark to get me going till the medevac came. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he starts like, come on, DT, fight for, fight for your wife, fight for your wife. And, and I look at him, it's like, dude, that's not going to work. Try something better. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> You're getting too serious on me, bro. You're getting too serious on me. <laughs> but, but, what he, but no, what he really did use was my son. Because yeah. he, he had known that I had lost my dad when I was young. And I always said, I'll never let that happen to my son. Yeah. So he started saying, he started using my son. I was like, come on, DT, fight for your boy. He said, you'll never let him grow up out of his dad like you did. Fight for your boy. And he's making me yell it. I got to fight for my boy. I got to fight for my boy. And then he says the weirdest thing, man. And I'm not joking. <laughs> he's like, come on, DT, fight for your son so you can teach him to be a pimp. <laughs> like, did he really just say that? <laughs> and he says it again. So there's... There's Sergeant Del Toro, butt naked in Afghanistan, yelling as loud as he can. I got to fight for my son so I can teach him to be a pimp. But you know, <laughs> I mean, it works, right? It worked. <laughs> it kept me going until the medevac came. And, and I remember they wanted to carry me. I was like, oh, hell no. I walked into this fight. I'm going to walk out of it. Nice. And I hobbled my naked ass to the helicopter, thinking to myself, oh, my God. I was like, I'm finally kind of relaxed. And they're probably going to give me some good drugs right now. Oh, yeah. And I remember the flight in and out, landing in our fob, and then be, being taken to the little field hospital we had there. Uh, seeing us, like, I remember seeing uh, some of my Army buddies, uh, like Furman was there. And the doc cutting off my watch and telling me, you're going to be okay. I was... February, or I mean, uh, December 4th, 2005. I wake up March of 06, man. Four months I was in a coma. Oh my God. And it, it's crazy being in a coma. No doubt. It doesn't really hit you until a year later. You know, I mentioned how I was, I was a big baseball guy. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, it was uh, January of 2007, and I'm watching Sports Center. And I hear, this is a one year anniversary of Kirby Puckett's death. I'm like, when did per Kirby Puckett die? <laughs> it, it was when you, I was in a coma. So yeah. it's crazy. Four months out of your life, you have no memory of nothing. So you just, so you went in and four months later, it was like you just woke up and you don't remember anything at all. You didn't wake up at all during the whole thing or, man, oh man. You know, I, I wake up and they start asking you, me, Hey, Sergeant Del Toro, uh, do you know where you're at? It's like, well, obviously I got hurt. I'm thinking launch tool, you know, it's like, no, you're, you're in San Antonio. It's like, okay. Do you know the date? December something? No, sorry. It's March of 06. Jeez. And you're like, holy shit. And, and, and now they're going into what had happened to you. The gas under the tour, 80% of your body has third degree burns. We gave you a 15% chance to survive. You almost died on us three times. And, and yeah, now you're awake, but you're still gonna be here for another year and a half. You may not walk again. You'll be on a respirator for the rest of your life and, and your career's pretty much over. And, and they're waiting for me to respond. And I couldn't move because my, my, my muscles are atrophied. I'm all wrapped yeah. up. I'm seeing that I have, you know, lost digits on my hands. And, you know, they pretty much, I pretty much, they had to read my lips because I had a trach. I pretty much told them, you, you can kiss my ass. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to accept that diagnosis. I am not going to accept you telling me what my life's going to be. I'm going to choose what my life is going to be. And from that day, man, I, I pushed I asked them, get me up, get me trying to get walking again. And, and, and you figured learning how to walk again would be easy, but it was one of the most some painful things I ever went through. Really? And then when you're severely burned, your skin becomes hypersensitive. Oh. And 
you know, you could have rubbed a feather across my hand and it felt like you were cutting me with razor blades. Uh, but I had every day go to therapy and hit my hands against carpet, rocks, you know, marbles, whatever. So I can eventually, you know, see my son and hold him. Cause that's, all, that's, that was my spark. I wanted to see my boy. Yeah. Uh, uh, but then I started noticing I, while I was in, you know, when I was during recovery that the burn guys weren't treated the same as the amputees. Like our therapy room, uh, where we had, uh, our, our therapy was maybe the size of a, like a normal living room. Mm -hmm. Yet the amputees there at BAMC at Brook Arm Medical Center was like five times the size. Oh, okay. And so, yes, I, I miss being with the guys on range, but I knew all these wounded guys that were here now were my teammates. Sure. Yes, I was wounded, but I was still an NCO in the Air Force. And the job of the NCO is to take care of his troops, even though that he may never see any of the benefits. Right. So I started becoming a big advocate for these guys. Uh, because I remember when the CFI was about to open, they wanted us all to be there, all the burn guys in the audience. Because we outnumbered the amputees, I want to say five to one. Oh, okay. Uh, but yet, they weren't going to have any of us in the CFI. But you wanted us th there in the audience for show. So I, I, I said, I, I, I told them all, we're not going to show up and, and kiss our ass. Yeah. And I, we're, we're not going to be props. Right, right. For, for a place of, you know, generals and celebrities. And, and we're not even going to be allowed inside that facility. Mm -hmm. And the leadership came down. They heard about it, the BAMC leadership. And, and I, you know, I, I went off. I'm like, I'm sorry, sir. You know, I probably should have used better tack. <laughs> I, I, I was like, what? I was blown up. What are you going to send me? Downrange again and get blown up again? <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, I was like, it's bullshit. I was like, you want us to be prop, but you're, you're not going to let any of us be in the CFI yeah. to say that we are therapy. And, and my intention was never for me to be the first to be there. I wanted it for my guys. Right. But, you know, I ended up being the first one they allowed in and then guys started coming in. But, you know, I, I had to do it, you know, because like, it was just wasn't right because we yeah. were almost treated like second class citizens. That's so weird that they would do that. Like, I mean, what's... Like, what was their rationale for that? Like, what, I mean. No one knows, man. I don't know who, you know, was in charge of, you know, that decision, but I was, they realized it probably wasn't a smart one. Yeah, no doubt. You know, and probably wasn't working there anymore <laughs> after that. <laughs> right. But, you know, I, I, that's what I did. I became an advocate. And then, you know, I eventually left that hospital two months after I did wake up, you know, walking and breathing my own, nice. beating those odds. And then, you know, like I said, they just, just trying to keep being stronger, trying to go back to the hospital. You know, obviously I still went back, you know, yes, I was out of the hospital walking and breathing at home, but my stamina wasn't as far. Like I could walk a hundred feet and I was just exhausted. So I had to build that up. So I kept going back to therapy. Yeah. But while I was there, I'll go to the ICU and, and talk to these guys and help them try it and find their spark. It's like, hey man, I know where you're at. I've been there. Yes, it sucks. Don't give up, man. I was like, it's like your mind's a very powerful thing. He said, you got this. Believe it. Get that spark. You know, if it's, you know, someone says you can't do it, let that be your spark. It's like, oh, I'm going to show you I can do it. Definitely. You know, if it's your kids or your, your loved ones, let that be your spark. So I kept going back, just trying to, you know, motivate these guys. Just like, you know, my medic did for me when I was downrange, when I wanted to fall asleep. Right. I wanted to pay it back. 